Hello, 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 and welcome to the Loudcast with me, your host, Kevin McLean. I am still here, still in my flat and leaf, still bringing you some of the very best of spoken word. And it is lovely to be back after about ooh, a month off from releasing any Loudcast episodes. We kind of informally wrapped the season. That was kind of a pilot season where we were getting to grips with the tech and the setup and all those uh, painful things that Mark does and I don't really look at. Uh, so that was that was what the, the pilot season was for. And we're, we're very excited that we got some funding from National Lottery through Creative Scotland and we are able to bring you even more of the Loudcast. So if you were watching or listening last season and you have come back, Thank you so much. We are glad that you enjoyed the pilot season and hopefully this will be even bigger and better and you'll enjoy it even more. And if this is the first time you're listening or watching us on the YouTube version, then hello and welcome. Uh, please do make sure to uh, hit the subscribe button below or to follow us on whatever podcast platform you're checking us out. It would mean a lot to us and it helps us get more eyes, more ears, joining in and, and helping us out with the conversation that is the Loudcast. And this season, we are focusing in on the Scottish spoken word scene. We're going to be giving you uh, insight into funding, into nights that are run, into sort of outside perspectives, perspectives from uh, amazing poets and, and promoters and all that good stuff. It's going to be a real deep dive into the Scottish spoken word scene. We have some amazing guests lined up. I am very excited. And I am not going to waste your time for a second more. We're going to dive right into it with a poem from a, one of our live event shows uh, from a, an amazing writer, performer, promoter, all those good things who will be a guest in a couple episodes time. The amazing Cat Hepburn. She is one half of Sonnet Youth and a good, good pal of ours. And this is her performing her the, the title poem from her amazing book and show Girlhood. This is Cat Hepburn. Apparently... We use softer language and vocal tones to speak to girl baby bumps. See, we boys kick inside us like Lionel Messi, but we girls, shh, they're sensitive. They don't like loud noises. Sugar and spice and all things nice. Life's pink frills, hearts and cupcakes, lipstick, unicorns and kittens, sparkles and princess glitter. Feminine is inoffensive, passive. We are passengers and men, they're at the driving seat. From day dots, we're easy targets for toy companies who slap words like caring, sweet, cute, love, friendship, mummy, magic, fun, fashion and babies all over the products that condition who we then become. But all that girly stuff, dollies and pretty dresses, wearing lipstick or painting nails, invites judgment, you see. Because little girls can be whoever they want to be, as long as they're not distracted by meaningless and shallow femme practices. And on the other hand, if you're too butch or boyish or you veer away from binary norms in any way, then that is just as bad, if not worse. Thank goodness for advertisements telling us it's cool to fight like a girl, run like a girl, have the body of a human woman. I wasn't sure until I saw that shower gel campaign. With each new generation, childhood is shrinking. Girlhood is a commodity, packaged and sold back to us with extra tax. And we are sexualised, far too young. Padded bras in pre-mark for seven-year-olds. Cheeky PJs with provocative slogans on the bums of young ones not yet old enough to have had their first kiss. Girls, options for you come in twos. Family or career, Madonna or whore, Wayne's or Baron Spinster or married. And please expect to get paid less than men. But don't you worry, according to magazines, you can have it all. Get up, kids ready, work out, go to your job. Come on, you can show them who's boss. But you shouldn't be too bossy, that's not attractive. You should just smile and nod and make sure your day to night figure hugging but not too slutty outfit matches. Don't let the cracks show. Be fun. Act caring but stay strong. Look young but live long. Whatever you do, don't get girlhood wrong. Thank you. Cat Hepburn there with Girlhood. Ah, oh, what a performance. I love Cat so much. She is such a dynamic performer. She writes about like the current real world so 
so eloquently, so kind of importantly, uh, but always with a, a sense of humor and, and a, a kind of look at, you know, she doesn't shy away from from the uh, sort of less poetic areas of modern life, I guess. Big fan of Cat. Go and check out all of her work and everything she's doing with Sonic Youth and get ready for, like I said, her being a guest on the show coming up. But for now, we are going to go to our next video, which uh, kind of includes two poems. So there was not going to be three videos this week, but uh, this one has two poems within it. And it is the final part of our Amazing Return to Form series. Uh, last last sort of season of the Loudcast, we were covering them at the end there. We were going over each uh, form and discussing it with our guests, and we didn't get to the final one. So we are kicking this season off uh, with that last piece, and it is from two I Am Loud favourites, uh, OG LP uh, member uh, Georgia Bartley McNeil and the the lovely, wholesome Stuart Kenny, two of my, my favourite people, favourite writers. This is their concrete poetry. Return to Form is a project exploring different styles of poetry. We pair up two poets, challenging them to use the same form and the same inspirational material to show how totally different pieces can be created from the same starting point. Concrete poetry, visual poetry, where the shape of the poem relates to its meaning. There is resilience here. Concrete grit. Refusal to be worn down though we'd be forgiven if cracks were to start showing. A city of sandstone. Dulled through the years, a legacy of coal fires, hence the nickname, Aldriki. Fair Edinburgh, constant in your beauty, whether streets are loud or quiet. Gracious even when few visitors stop to gasp in awe or slow their footsteps to cast their gaze as fishermen would hurl their nets to the sea. Your castle and your causeways steeped so richly in history. Your statues seem to dip their heads in acknowledgement, even as footsteps metronomic in the rhythm of rushing home fail to notice. The echoes of whispered secrets in dark venals, confessions and stolen kisses under starlight or in doorways. Your charactered tenements, all so similar but slightly different. I remember my many ventures up echoey corridors and worn stairwells. All the escapades. The university parties where music blared until 1am or else the hushed whispers in darkened rooms, lust masquerading as professions of love. By definition, I am but a visitor myself. A bright-eyed yet regular pilgrim from the honest tune. We Musselbra. And I love where I live, really I do, but honest old Ricky, you are my home too. Some of my best memories were made within the boundaries of your city limits. Like the time I went skinny dipping at Portobello Beach. Or taking in shows at the Fringe or nights out with my close friends, which were so good I can't really remember them. Sweet Edinburgh, you are where I found my voice, myself. Made me realize that home isn't just where your house is, or even where your heart is. You made me realize that home is me. Kirketan could cause an earthquake if she stood up. That old troll who lay down on her muddy sofa once so long ago and dozed off while the world grew up around her, attached itself to her shoulders, mud piling, drying, wetting, rising, solidifying in her creases, caking on her skin, bolting her body and crusting her chin. She's comfy enough there. Oh no, not stuck, just content, a little lazy. 
and considerate, aware that any movement would not only after so many years cause great muscle ache to herself, but would uproot a hundred trees, unhome a thousand birds, many more insects and a handful of mammals, including a few of those humans who tickle her with their hiking boots and cause the twitches which shake up the landscape. Long have her lips been locked, eyes shut, ears and nostrils blocked by mud sprouting plant life and spreading around her body to form the ecosystem you see today. How much life she has given to the world and how much she has sacrificed for all that which she has never had the chance to see. When the wind whistles she still wobbles a little. Look on a rainy day when so few do and the wet has washed away a layer or two of the muddy icing on the hillside you can just about trace the outlines on the hill that is home to a heart and a mind. And that was Stuart Kenny and Georgia Bartlett McNeil with some amazing concrete poetry. Uh, And that was Return to Form. I'm so glad we got to do the project. I hope you guys checked out the videos and the accompanying workshops. And if you haven't, don't worry, because we're going to be doing NapoRimo. When this video comes out, we will have already started, but uh, you can join in with NapoRimo. And we're going to be tackling all the forms we did in Return to Form. Uh, And we're going to be doing a sort of weekly roundup of our writing during Naporimo, and that's going to be all the guys from I Am Loud. So that's me, Katie, Bex, and Mark. We're going to be doing every week, every week. Oh dear. Uh, so I hope it's going well. That, you know, a goodwill to future Kev and his writing because he needs the help. Uh, but for now, we move past Return to Form and away from Naporimo into the main event of this episode of the Loudcast, and that is my very special guest today. I'm so glad to kick off this brand new season with her. She is an amazing writer and performer, educator, theatre maker, musician, all those amazing things. Please welcome to the show, Imogen Sterling. How's it going, Imogen? It's going well. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> it's so nice to chat to you. It has been far too long since since we spoke. It certainly has. When did I last? When did I last see you? It would have been. I honestly well, couldn't tell you. Like that's 2019? terrible. Stop it! Quite possibly. Ugh, this is horrific. Uh, <laughs> wow. But you are are so so good to have you on as our very first guest for the Loudcast. Thank you for coming in and oh, chatting to us. Pleasure. And I sent you through, uh, before we, we sat down to record, I sent you the uh, last of the Return to Form videos. Mm-hmm. What did you think of the uh, the concrete poetry? Oh, I just loved it. You know, I had actually never heard the term concrete poetry. I knew what it was, but I didn't know that was the name, so I learned something there. Um, I loved it. They were beautiful pieces. Um, and I, I just think concrete poetry is such a fantastic form because, I mean, poetry has always been more than words to me. Um, for me, that's why I often pair it with music because I think it's 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 something to it's something to elevate the words, it's something to elevate the ideas within the poems, and it just they came across wonderfully. The 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 sort of cityscape structure to um, it was so vivid, it was so exciting to watch and to listen to. It just gave this whole new level to them. I, I loved it. I think it's interesting what you say there about like you knew what concrete poetry was but you didn't know it was called concrete poetry and that's like summed up my whole experience with Return to Farm has been going (laughs) oh that's like a thing oh that's (laughs) interesting (laughs) and it was it was kind of the the point of doing Return to Farm in a way was like our our suggestion that writing spoken word which is predominantly Mm. free form isn't Mm. doesn't mean we don't understand form and structure it just means it's not the priority of the piece we don't stick to it like religiously that there's you know an element of form and lots of different forms maybe in a single piece so that was kind of what we're trying to present and i'm glad that that has been the the reaction of people going oh i was doing that already yeah that's very cool yeah, it's something like I, I kind of realised I've I've sort of experimented a bit with with this sort of concrete poetry form because for me, like because I am predominantly working in spoken word, something that I've always struggled with is um when I'm having to translate my, my writing to the page, just sort of <laughs> yeah. line length. It sounds really silly, but I'm not thinking about how things look when I'm writing it for performance. And so if you sort of work within 
I don't know when when I'm trying to when I'm trying to write my poem on the page, the decisions that I'm making about where to kind of break lines and how to structure it, they're so arbitrary and they're kind of baseless. Whereas if you then incorporate <laughs> the concrete poetry form, um, it just gives this really nice structure, allows you to make kind of informed decisions about how you're presenting your work. I think it's so smart. I think it's it's why form is more important, I guess, to you know people that that consider their work and consider how it's going to look on the page like i never print anything right so no. why would i concern myself with oh that line breaks like i know the uh -huh. rhythm and i might want to change the rhythm depending on the mood or the the, totally. the show i'm at or whatever like the, the the sort of point of spoken word being that changeability that kind of ephemeral nature right so you're like I do get why we don't, but I, it's, it is interesting kind of mm. do as a writing exercise to put yourself into those forms. Definitely. And I especially think it's interesting, like when you get someone like uh, like Stuart Kenny and Georgia, mm -hmm. where like Georgia really does, she gets form. She writes a, a huge amount in form, where Stuart is very much that mm. kind of spoken word, uh, mm. free form, a lot of rhyme and a lot of like sort of, uh, yeah, compound rhyme structures mm. and stuff. But uh not someone who's bashing out Sestinas. <laughs> and so totally. like it was interesting to see how they both tackled it really differently. And like the uh, the, the visual element, like mm. you make a good point about um, people who bring other stuff to their work. And so it was when I saw Stuart's and he had sort of done the Pentland Hills, it so made sense to me because so much of his work is about like tourism travel exactly. and nature and things like that. And it's amazing how such a short kind of poem and abstract piece where you're, you think you're being put into something so rigid actually gave him a chance to say something very personal, which is not what he normally does with his work. So yeah, I was, I was, I was kind of really blown away by the concrete pieces. Yeah. I loved his piece too, because something, because he so often writes about, um, Kind of nature and outdoor spaces uh, and the two of us are, are based in, in different cities so um we don't have those same familiar points of reference <laughs> so quite but he has this great ability to whatever he's describing he makes it sort of like the every place like he could be describing this mountain that is very specific to him but the way he writes it could be you know it allows me to put my own interpretation on it and when it was then complemented by the the concrete poetry form it just like immediately looking at it on the page, it reminded me of of this sort of landscape from my hometown, which is not at all the place that he's describing, but it just complemented it so nicely that it allowed me to generate an even clearer idea in my head of where I could sort of take his words and apply them to. It was lovely. I think that's one of the core kind of aspects of, of what I look for in spoken word poetry mm -hmm. is something so personal that it could mean something to everyone which is a kind of contradiction right like but there's there's times mm -hmm. where someone drops in something i i think back to when we uh doing the sort of return to form series uh -huh. reached the the first installment uh was a golden shovel by rachel rachel amy and mm -hmm. she talks about this uh, very specific smell of like cardamom and baked apples mm -hmm. and i was like that's not a smell i associate with any, anything mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but she's it's so specific that i was like that's a moment there is something like Definitely. trapped in her head like you know a snow globe effect of like a preserved moment that it doesn't matter and then I, it made me immediately think of what those smells are for me mm -hmm. and it's that's the real trick if you can if you can lay over your personal story in a way that that encourages someone to ignore the differences but like kind of trigger their own mm -hmm. version yeah oh yeah that's it, spot on spectacularly done by by everyone involved i was blown away by return to form and like we we, we hope to do it again um because i think it was a really good way especially during lockdown mm -hmm. to to present poetry like uh mm -hmm. i don't know your sort of thoughts on <laughs> we're, we're gonna get into everything you've been up to in lockdown <laughs> imogen but uh -huh. uh in terms of like presentation i thought it was it was nice to release some stuff that was less here is the poet being filmed delivering the poem and do something a bit more conceptual because I don't think we often do that in spoken word. Oh, definitely. And it just shows you how kind of multifaceted these different writers and performers are. It's it's brilliant um, when you're so used to just seeing this person on a stage. Uh, yeah, see, seeing their work translated into this new form and, or sort of picking a piece of the form that maybe you didn't realise was in their work. It's so interesting. It's a really invaluable project. 
Well, you know, like I was saying in my intro of you, Imogen, I'm sure by this point you are already deep into taking part in NaPoWriMo with us. So I can't see wait to see you tackle oh, all geez. those forms and all the poems <laughs> you release on a weekly basis. Um, can but, but you try. are someone who <laughs> you are someone who experiments with form, um, and because I wanted to speak to you about that, because uh, mm. from being kind of more aware of form coming off the back of that project Mm. I'm now seeing it more readily in other poems and uh when I was watching Speak um which is the sort of cinepoem you made with Sarah Grant Mm -hmm. who we've had on the show a really good friend of I Am Loud Mm -hmm. uh you guys collaborated to make a really Mm -hmm. beautiful piece and it was again about rooted in a location um it was for Paisley right yeah yeah that's right um yeah, it was. I was doing a writing res- residency with the festival and had to create a sort of a, a creative response, I guess, to the festival and to the people that I'd worked with. And yeah, Sarah helped me to to form this lovely piece of work, very much rooted in Paisley. It was it was really nice. But I connect it into uh, Return to Form, obviously, because uh-huh. I noticed sort of the the sort of main opening section is univocal and like it. I, I watched it when you know sort of preparing to, uh-huh. to chat to you here and it because when I had first seen it it didn't click in my mind and then I watched it back and I was like oh my god it's the perfect example of yeah. what I mean by how spoken <laughs> word poets use form in a less strict way like you start univocal and then you blur out of it but then you use like a bunch of assonance and like you know rhyme structure and stuff and I was like ah this is the Yay. example <laughs> so what was the sort of thought and choice behind going univocal at the, in, in that piece um good question uh no i I, (laughs) no there there are there are reasons there are reasons um i mean i love i just love univocal language i think it's it's so interesting um for spoken word particularly because when you're limited to to one vowel or or limited vowels you are actually opened up it's so it's so restricting but it opens up this beautiful kind of feast of, of of assonance and rhyme because you are just you're relying on this one vowel, you're relying on the, the numerous sounds that that one vowel can make. And so just in general for spoken word, I find it a really interesting tool to incorporate because it very much um, comes alive when it's spoken aloud. And then for that particular piece, I was just thinking a lot about um, the, the, the festival's theme, uh, which I was to respond to was Radical New Futures. And it was all about looking looking ahead to a more hopeful post-pandemic future. Um, looking anywhere but the looking present. Looking anywhere uh. but where we are. <laughs> and and <laughs> what our hopes and aspirations are, what is holding us back just now. And I was just thinking, I guess, about how restricted everybody is in, in so many ways at the moment. Um, how expression feels very limited because of location being limited and company being limited and platforms to speak being limited. And the poem was supposed to kind of represent the journey of this this figure, um, fe- feeling stuck, feeling restricted, but finally becoming aware of the possibilities that the future holds. And so I thought it'd be nice if he began speaking in this univocal style, um, and then and then branching out into fuller, more complete, free flowing language. Um, I guess that was the reason behind it. Plus, it's just it's quite fun to play around with. <laughs> I mean that should be the the key point right it should, because it, it was should. fun to do like more of the work we do should be because it was fun yes. and I enjoyed it yeah. That's <laughs> That's, I, I think I, the, the thing I found about uh, especially something like univocal because mm. I've done I, I haven't written a univocal poem uh, ever I'm so scared for that mm. for Napoleon I don't want to do it and um, but I'm I've started like you know trying to write maybe little lines in univocal mm. and just think about kind of word lists and stuff mm. and it's I didn't realize how much I rely on the same vocabulary over <laughs> and over again <laughs> I, I thought I had quite a good range of vocabulary I don't I don't there's so many words words i have never ever uttered um, i know you're telling me do you have do you have like any tips or hints for someone who's about to struggle to write a univocal of how you went about like i don't know could, did you do word lists or whatever or are you just one of those people that knows all the words images absolutely have not to fall out with you? <clears throat> no no not at all and i find it really difficult and i find it very interesting too because i do a lot of um uh sort of workshops and education um 
in spoken word. And I do find that it's when you are speaking to non-writers, they actually grasp univocal, the univocal style so much more easily than writers do, which I find fascinating. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. It's like their minds are just perhaps a little bit open, a little bit freer. They're not already <laughs> predicting their failure <laughs> at this style, which is so cool. But I do find word lists really useful because you kind of you can go into it thinking this is going to be easy. I'm going to be able to conquer it. And then you just get stuck. So starting with a word list is really helpful, but also just not getting frustrated by it, like enjoying the fact that it is hard and not, yeah, <laughs> yeah. not getting stuck in your head thinking that you're failing and not doing well. Um, and also appreciating that when you read it aloud, it's, it does come to life. It can look like nothing on the page sometimes. And then you vocalize it and it just sounds so rich and, and interesting, even when that is incorporating the most basic language, which is really cool. That's, yeah, yeah. I, I think that is, I mean, you could you could apply that tip to, to spoken word in general, right? It yeah. is like a, a patience and like repetition thing. You do need to, and hearing it out loud, mm -hmm. the amount of stuff I, I kind of write down and go, ah, oh, this doesn't, but then as soon as you put some performance behind yeah. it and get the right rhythm or, or sort of, yeah tonality to it it just mm. it can it can totally change a piece of work Completely. i think it's interesting when you talk about like uh you know changing pieces of work and like finished products and mm. stuff because i associate so much of your work now with music and like particular uh -huh. pieces of music and like i don't know if you've fallen into a similar trap that i have because like i work a lot with musicians uh where now i don't like hearing some of some of my poems <laughs> without the music like how how do you because you have i think you're similar to me right you've got like a theater background mm -hmm. but you also have like a music background right you can sing and stuff and um, so how do you approach like pairing in music with 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 your work yeah, it, it is difficult. I definitely feel the same as you. I I feel really just naked and exposed if I'm performing <laughs> without music. It's really strange. Um, and I think it's just been a gradual kind of progression. Um, I always, I just think spoken word and, and music are the most perfect pairing. I think they complement each other beautifully. And it's really important yeah. to me that it, that music is just featured in my work now. Um, um, when I started, it was more a case of... Um, a compliment, I suppose, um, finding a musician who was really sensitive to, to sort of language and dynamics and, and stories really, um, who could provide, who could just sort of like riff off of my um, poem and, and create something lovely that supported it and, and elevated it in whatever way. But I'm really trying just now to almost push beyond that in a way. I've really, I just think there is this lovely middle ground that exists somewhere between, between that poetry and, and backing music and sort of rap and hip hop. I think there's somewhere where poetry and music exist in almost um, like a 50-50 waiting. There's really kind of perfect equal marriage of the two, which is what I'm aiming for at the moment. Um, and it's really, I mean, I don't play an instrument, so that is a bit of a problem. I ju I'm just a vocalist. Um, so it really is a case of just finding musicians who, who get it and to who someone are... who is tone deaf Imogen <laughs> saying I can just <laughs> sing tremendously is like the most painful thing to hear I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> no I've just been frustrated like I've tried to learn an instrument so many times um I had a keyboard and a guitar at the beginning of lockdown and that was my thing that I was gonna I was gonna have them nailed and it, it just didn't happen I, I don't oh, we all had hopes at the start of lockdown image and don't feel bad they're about gone. that they're gone. Those hopes are gone. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I, I totally agree this is about to veer wildly from a informal chit chat to me making a, a, a business plan with you uh, <laughs> but I, I totally agree because I think there's so many cool ways to incorporate like when when it goes from being background music, mm. and don't get me wrong, I absolutely love that, and there's a place for that. Like me we too. both collaborated with people like Jack Hinks. Mm -hmm. uh, I know, you know, like when we, when we work with our kind of resident band of like Fiona and Sam and Ali and Jack mm. and that uh, Woody and stuff, but before them, um, mm. like it, it, they just get it. They know how to follow the pe pace and beat of a poem. They know how to like n do less than they would. That they're mm. not the standout thing. You, you know, they know how to back it, and it's mm. it's beautiful to work with. But then when we did stuff like uh, Katie Ailes did Calluses um, with mm -hmm. Jack, uh, which is available on the channel. Go and watch it. <laughs> then, uh, like, they they did, a, you know, it was a collaborative writing process. Uh -huh. The music and the poem cannot be separated. They don't work without each other. And it got me really thinking. And one of the things I, I've 
so proud that I made mm. was when we were down in London we had this lovely big house uh, like because I got an amazing deal on Airbnb um, and we we shot this video where it was um, I love a version of Forever Young by Audra May um, and so we did like them playing and I wrote a poem to go in the instrumental sections between it yeah. and I was like it just it it just feels really nice. Like it's just this weird kind of ju- merging of like a folk song with poetry. Mm-hmm. And it, it, I was, I, I started thinking like, oh, you could do this with more music. And then mm-hmm. I saw your trailer uh, for uh, Text Me When You Get Home, uh-huh. which is the, 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 the thing you're working on currently. Big shout out to Imogen's uh, new amazing project, Sirens Theatre Company, right? It's going to mm-hmm. be, uh, the, the, the show's going to be insane. But um I saw that trailer and you do exactly the same thing mm. where you take a, an existing song. What's the track? That's going to drive me crazy now. You take an existing song yes. and they are singing yes. while there's uh, poetry punctuating it. Yeah. It's, do you remember the track? That, that project is really interesting because it's, it's not, um, it's not, it wasn't originally a kind of poetry show and it isn't a poetry show. It just features poetry very heavily um right yeah, yeah. And, and it's yeah it's it's so interesting it's um siren is basically a, a collaboration between uh, myself and three other women um and we're all from very different creative backgrounds so i come from a like bits of theater and music but very heavily spoken word background and then we have a musician we have a um sort of cabaret artist a director there's a, there's a whole host of um creative input and it's just been this brilliant sort of experiment of throwing everything together seeing the styles that fit and it's just brilliant poetry does keep coming out as this wonderful like rhythmic spoken overlay to a full band setup it's really interesting and there's a lot of like jumping between the styles like you say um you know starting a a poem with a sort of musical underscore and then the music takes over and then the music drops out and then the poetry comes in it's really it's it's it's, it's a very interesting project, very creatively exciting. Absolutely, I, I'm I'm really excited to, to kind of see see yeah. what because uh, I saw when you launched the company and it was just like immediately knowing your previous work, you know, uh, mm-hmm. with things like hypocrisy, I was just like, this is going to be exciting and it's going to be a really good showcase of, of spoken word. But yeah, I was blown away when that that trailer came out and oh. the, you know that that sort of like merging of everything where it was you know you got live music mm-hmm. with the sort of live theater aspect, the spoken word aspect, and it all kind of tied in. I'm very very excited uh how is how is putting the show together during lockdown going because if i remember correctly like you just started working on it and then the pandemic happened <laughs> yeah yeah it was very unfortunate um but yeah i mean i'm i met the other women all very kind of um uh spontaneously we participated in this residency uh, at the tron theater in Oh geez, dates are dates are nothing now. October twenty nineteen <laughs> must have been. I think yeah. yeah Some that, portion of time ago. I don't uh, know. I don't know. <laughs> but no, everything was kind of kicking off. Um, we'd started working together in the kind of like the early twenty twenty, and yeah, we we had a really exciting time planned. We had all these different development opportunities uh, for the show, and we were yeah we were in the Tron rehearsing um, in March. And it was so apocalyptic. There was kind of talk of this whole COVID thing. And then the theatre staff basically walked into our rehearsal room and was like, this is the last time that you'll be in a theatre for the foreseeable. Very sorry. Um, And it it certainly was difficult, I think, because both the company and the project were were very much in their infancies, um, sort of forging ahead with the same creative momentum was difficult, but we were just very, very structured about it. Um, we, we did a lot of content creation online. We had weekly meetings online and we we sort of boldly decided to go ahead with um, our plans for our sort of theatre development period, which we really hoped would be in a rehearsal space together, but we also kind of had a backup plan to do it online somehow, um, if need be. But um, fortunately, we, we, we were funded to do it and we had the chance in that funny little pre-Christmas period when all the rules uh, lifted, um, we were able to get into a theatre space in the Tron um, and working within every safety guideline imaginable, um, we were able to kind of create physically together and it was, it was brilliant. Um, 
it's still it's still difficult certainly to um, stay sort of inspired and motivated when the theatre industry particularly is just so empty and precarious um, but we, we we have hope and we are we are pushing on <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Like, it is, it is so difficult. Like, I, mm. I have huge, you know, empathy for, for every artist uh, trying to, like, figure out how to continue to produce. Yeah. And, and as, especially those, you know, who who it is a living. Like, I, I know from, from my point of view, it has been <laughs> rough. Uh, so it is good to see you guys uh, being able to get an opportunity mm. uh, to, to, you know, like, still work on that thing to not yeah. have to go, oh, well, this is, you know something that then goes on the back burner totally. i did also want to bring up with you because like obviously you know the last uh few weeks have highlighted you know, or, or drawn a spotlight onto an issue that like always exists mm. uh and that that you know is I, I i i assume a large part about the show like specifically that title you know takes me when you get home mm. which is is something that like clearly uh every woman understands right like uh-huh. the, the implications behind that statement and that clearly ties in and it has been highlighted with recent events uh, around like male violence and the the, the protests that um mm. you know have, have, have surrounded mm. that like i wanted to to speak to you about um have you been has that changed the show? Because I, I think one of the most interesting things, I and mean, when we're talking, I know you're saying it's not, you know, solely a spoken word mm. show, but when I look at kind of spoken word, I think about it of going, we have the luxury of that our poems are malleable. They can change and they're they're never pinned down. But I think every like luxury comes with a responsibility, right? And that kind of puts on us that if you are someone who writes politically or on those kind of subjects, that we, that there is a responsibility to to um incorporate the now to make it ephemeral and current. Like is mm-hmm. that something that, that it affects your practice and how you make stuff? Yeah, it's it's funny. I mean, with this show, you kind of like hit the nail on the head, really, when you said it is. It's not a new conversation. Um, women's safety is. Yeah. It was as relevant back in October twenty nineteen when we kind of conceived the idea as it is now, all this time down mm-hmm. the line. And it's it's strange because it's just that the spotlight has been shone back on the issue on a much more um, public, a larger scale. And so it, it it is funny because you know our our um our sort of passion for the show our the it hasn't changed it's as crucial to us as it ever was and it yeah. it is strange now that of course i mean as you say the show is is named text me when you get home that 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 phrase is everywhere just now and so of course there is this this feeling of an obligation to um really contribute now immediately to that conversation and to to somehow contribute meaningfully to it without coming across as crass and you are sort of promoting your show by jumping into the sort of reinserting yourself back into the narrative which is which is quite strange and we certainly have felt i mean we're in we, we just had a meeting together this morning about events and sort of happenings that we can organize because the future of the show is so far ahead because the theater industry is it's it's quiet just now so we are planning for far ahead but we also want to be here now contributing somehow so that's something that we're really talking about just now but it's it's also difficult because the show is very um as much as it is it's not like a doom and gloom show it is it is a serious show but it is also so joyful and um, there's so much kind of i mean that's something that runs through your work entirely imogen i always think you're someone who tackles very big subjects but I always try. tackles them like trying at least in the round of your poem there is always you know that positivity that outlook of change or, mm. or something better to come like i think you you do that a lot in your work oh that's i'm glad that comes across because it's it's very easy to get weighted down in, in in the bad stuff but it's yeah i mean i mean yeah this this show is all about kind of female safety or nights out or 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 lack of safety and the, the necessity for sort of hyper vigilance from women but that sort of reaching the fact that going out is 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 brilliant is exciting is fun and we want that <laughs> like we want the show to be like a really good night out as much as it is as it is sort of educating and informing about a, a sort of parallel issue um and yeah, I mean, it's difficult because it's also, it's a hard show to make and you have to protect the people who are involved in it as as much as possible rather than just saying like, quick, let's sort of put out more content now. Let's engage in this conversation more. Like we've been very mindful of 
the the sort of mental well-being and um what really of, of all the team involved so it's, it's finding that balance between contributing to the conversation now staying hopeful staying joyful and pres preserving our own sanity to be perfectly honest um so it's it's a strange time to be making the show um but it feels really important and that's that's what's driving us i suppose i i do think it's so interesting what you say there about like uh you know, you never wanting it to seem like uh, you are using a subject to sell a show, right? Totally. Or, or, or not a subject, but like a, a yeah. horrible, traumatic thing that has happened, right? Or is is happening on a mm. daily, like, and and you don't want to use that as a marketing tactic. And I, mm. I absolutely understand that. I th I found it fascinating to see. Uh, I think it was Vanessa Casuli I saw on Twitter mm -hmm. being like you know random male poet don't release your poem about this like <laughs> not about you and i was like oh man really is there still folk like who think that that is then a conversation for them and like i never wanted to seem like i'm like it is it is you know it's the women's responsibility to mm. talk about certain issues or like i mean you do a, a comparable situation mm. with like blm last mm. year right like i had a, a long conversation with uh tyrone about how like uh -huh he shouldn't have to write black poems right and like in any time like he is always like he is other things than than just a black person right like he is mm -hmm. a nerd and a, a, like a million a son and a uh, uh -huh. friend and like a producer like uh all those things and i was like but like if you are someone that that does it there is that kind of pressure and it goes back to conversations i had last season about like mm -hmm. authenticity in spoken word and the view that um what is being said is real and current and actual and has weight and impact to the person saying it mm -hmm. and like you as a, a th as someone who comes from a theater background you know that's a kind of different uh avenue but, I, but from looking at your work you you have really swung into the personal and the, the sort of current and things like that mm. and i find it really interesting is when i was you know doing research and stuff with dr katie ailes our amazing researcher uh, she was she had pointed out a, a phrase you had used which was uh around your education around gig poetry and i was like i wonder if that is uh, a term that like i've been thinking of as well of mm. like the difference between spoken word theater and kind of extended sets what do you mean when you say gig poetry <laughs> this is a good question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I've always been very familiar with, with gig theatre, which is where I then sort of warped the phrase and, and, right. and applied gig poetry to it, um, which is it's essentially the feeling of, of kind of, it's combining music and theatre, yes, but it's also, it's creating a, a gig-like environment. It's breaking down the sort of theatrical norms of, you know, attending a theatre and sitting in an audience and staying, uh, or sitting in a seating bank as the audience um staying quiet you know sort of having this real gap between uh audience and, and performer it's, it's really just about breaking all of that down um and i just think that is wonderful when it comes to poetry i mean both because to me gig poetry is both the very very tight blending of poetry and music um but it's also about sort of redefining the performer audience relationship quite often. I, I don't know, poetry is just such a brilliant form of immediate, direct, personal expression um, between speaker and listener. And sometimes it's just felt so unnatural to me to be sort of standing on a stage, silent audience, uh, you know, performance applause, people leave. There's no conversation, there's yeah. no... And so I, I somehow... I just want to interrogate and hopefully in some way redefine how a poetry show can happen, how we can take the, the sort of immediacy and vibrancy of a music gig and all that comes with it in that experience, but apply it to a poetry show. And I don't know, everything is just about the accessibility of poetry to me. I just, th I think it's so important. And I think really delving into this gig poetry style might be a real step towards reaching new people and telling new stories I absolutely I, I i totally agree because I, I i think it is important to like 
because you, you're you're an interesting uh it's why i was so keen to have you on sort of the, the first show mm-hmm. imogen because you you like do so much in the scene like we've mm-hmm. discussed right you do do education stuff but you're also like a very talented writer you know writer in residence for the the paisley festival and stuff like you you do uh spoken word theater and music like you, you wear all these hats and it's in in that that you 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 then become better at all of them, right? And mm. so I'm like, I, I see the push towards spoken word theater and I understand mm. it because you're in a position where like, okay, I write spoken word. What can I do with that? Oh, well, I guess I could write an hour show and produce it mm. and put it on at Fringe and Tour or whatever, right? Because there's nowhere to like, especially in Scotland, to be like, okay, well, I'll do all the gigs. And you're like, oh, mm. all how many gigs? Yeah. <laughs> like, it doesn't it doesn't equate. And so you don't refine that skill. Yeah. And so I see further and further the push to spoken word theater. Mm. And while I love spoken word theater, I think it would be a shame to lose what I kind of consider that gig poetry. And uh-huh. like I, I, the musical aspect totally comes into it because we always use it. But mm. that thing of like do a set do a show where you're you know you get that 20 15 minutes mm. to like or or i would love to see someone do and it happens less and less like just mm. like an hour of poems with uh-huh. like chat yes <laughs> like really good poems and a bit of chit chat and go oh here's one for you know off the back of that mm-hmm. and like da, da, da. but that sort of improvisational skill and ability to you know riff with an audience no one's learning that cuz they yep. they're only doing short sets or hour long Mm. presentations right yes what's what's your kind of like take on how to build those skills more is it to is it to do okay if you're going to do your your spoken word theater show make it more that kind of gig style where there are sections and you then step out and deal Mm. with the audience is that how you would go i mean it really varies because when i i mean when i toured hypocrisy for example Um, It was a strange experience. I I tried as much as I could to to, to widen it, to elevate it somehow, both, I mean, I had the, I had music very integral to it always, um, which I think helped with the the taking away of it being one person on stage for a very, very long time. Um, I think it was, it made it more, it reached new audiences, it was more kind of accessible in ways. Um, I quite often did either, not, not Q and A necessarily. That's a bit formal, but kind of open discussion sessions afterwards, where you would kind of stay behind, either like in the theatre space, in the theatre bar, something to sort of um, encourage a bit more discourse. But I think it was actually I I took the show to to Newcastle and did this um sort of I don't really know what you call it like a double bill type thing with um Jess Green and her oh, nice. uh, Jeremy Corbyn show and. It was wow, just... Wow, that's an evening. Oh, I'm glad I wasn't oh, in that it was gig. So, I'd, never, I'd heard so much about the show. I'd uh, never seen it. I'd heard so much about her. and never met her. And the show, to me, I mean, I've seen so many brilliant kind of poetry-based shows, but hers was so interesting because it was it, it was about an hour long. I don't know if you've seen it or not. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's just the way that she... It did have this constant audience interaction. It was it was poetry, Um it was, you know, there was a visual element, but she was constantly stopping herself and she was reading the room and she was responding to um, people in the, in the there and then. And it really inspired me because as much as my, as much as I had done things to my own performance to try to make it more, um, I don't know, open and, and, and accessible, the, it was still, it was still a performance. It was still a narrative being delivered without any kind of breathing space and her show was so full of breathing space and it just to me that was poetry in its most effective natural form it was this perfect communication between her and her audience and so i totally agree i i I saw jess uh do and again it's uh, she might i'm sad you didn't see this show Mm. because it might be bang on what you're talking about gig Uh poetry Uh first time i saw jess was 2014 fringe Mm -hmm. and she was doing uh her burning books show um with um the mischief thieves Mm -hmm. like a sort of band and it was literally how i went oh my god that well that's what we're doing (laughs) it was like guitar and cajon and like you know just a nice beat nice rhythm mm-hmm. very background but gave all this drive and punch to jesse's very yes. you know like she, she when she gets up to speed and does that sort of rapid mm. fire uh stuff it's it's electric and mm. the show is obviously 
you know, based on the book, which is a loose collect connection. Mm-hmm. You know, there is a, I think of it almost like a concept album. Mm-hmm. Like the stories relate; they're all based in you know a single school or whatever, but they're not dependent on each other. And it gives her exactly that room to talk and yeah. breathe and link the poems herself, rather than the narrative doing it and having to stay in that. And mm-hmm. yeah, it, it was like, oh wow, cool. There's the model for how you put on a single totally. show, right? Ah, that's that's a good shout. Jess is yeah. Jess is a great example. I yeah. had to do a lot of things. She's a smart <laughs> performer. She's yeah, absolutely brilliant. Excellent, excellent. So, what what is the hope then? Is it is that where your your main focus is just now? Is in uh, getting the the show finished and then coming back with that after you know when we can. <laughs> kind of yeah. I mean, at the moment, my focus is really torn between um between that show and my own personal show, Love the Sinner, which has been in development for a very long time due to due to COVID. Um and with the two of them because with Text Me When You Get Home, because it's all a bit more um like it's a larger team, it's all being done on a kind of bigger scale. At the moment we're um we're finalising the script. We're aiming for like fringe next year, which is just a very long time away. Um and so it's I think there's gonna in the interim period there will be more kind of musical development time um but also hopefully a lot more sort of outreach and engagement work um between those points i think just as a way to to continue that momentum um to to keep the conversation going to keep <clears throat> the awareness there and then for love the sinner it's actually a really interesting point just now because it's just i've just brought on a new um musical collaborator and we're delving into oh. very like electronic style which is really cool Ooh, um that sounds very cool yeah. th- because most of the stuff i've seen with poetry has been you know acoustic-y mm-hmm. or, or or whatever whereas like uh someone like nadia freeman i don't know if you know yes. nadia she she does a lot of like strange electronic light soundscape stuff it's yes. very weird but i'm into it oh no she's brilliant um yeah definite inspiration there i i just i don't know i think i've always liked i like working very closely with another person and um, i like it being quite an intimate mm-hmm. sort of um set up on, on, on stage and I, I just love close collaboration too but I just thought I've done so much work with the more acoustic style um, I love oh, electronic right. music and I think I, I just I saw this woman um, she did a gig a gig theatre show um, at the Fringe a couple of years ago where the, the text and the music that she was creating on stage they were so perfectly in sync and it was just so smart I think the two the two styles when they're very polished and then perfectly presented it just is it's so oh, it's so satisfying it it leaves behind the kind of looseness of of live music which i love as well but i think this is a very interesting it's pushing me creatively to go down this different route um so that's my kind of immediate focus just now is uh finalizing that music script pairing there nice yeah. nice it's it's uh it, it actually saul williams is maybe the only person i've seen really do like ele- really good electronic music with mm-hmm. with poetry when sonic youth hosted him in glasgow that was an amazing gig uh because it was just it was it was the most like a concert and i know saul you know uh-huh. does sort of music stuff as well mm-hmm. but like uh yeah really really insane so that's very exciting i i, I will definitely be there with my glow sticks uh, please, ready to go. please. <laughs> <laughs> imogen uh it's, it's it's been so lovely talking to you and uh we, we you know we're going to be doing the loudcast extra mm-hmm. where we're going to be chatting uh more about your work and and all of that good stuff uh but would you mind rounding off this episode of the loudcast the first one back with yes. uh, a poem of course, of course. Amazing, amazing. Um, yeah, I was thinking about what to perform, um, and I thought, well, the Love of the Sinner script is the one that I'm focusing on so much at the moment, so I thought I would do a little excerpt from that, if that is suitable. Ooh, a little sneak peek. A little sneak peek. Ace. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Oh. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I thought, basically, the, the, the show, it, um, it takes the, the characters of the Seven Deadly Sins and reimagines them, sets them as, as uh, characters within a contemporary Scottish cityscape. Um, and I thought I would focus on the character of Pride um, and share that. If that sounds good. Excellent. Amazing. Yeah, perfect. Lovely. Okay. So this sort of, I don't know if it requires context or not. I'm not really used to performing these out of, out of the full thing. But um, 
He's not in a good way, basically. So midway through the show, half an hour in, he's not in a great way. And this poem sort of explores, <laughs> explores why. Imagine it with music, if you, if you can. <laughs> he woke up and there was peace, like a perfect vacuum, horizontal in a room that smelt of space, that brought him grace from usual daily mornings laced with friction, her body tensed with frosted animosity that he attempts to melt with puns and coffee vapours as they sit in breakfast table stalemate. Conversation long evaporated into disinterest. She is a heavenly statue, cold and impassive. The house hangs heavy on her word, but not today. This morning brought forgotten respite, eased into the day with open heart and gentle wake, just his arm draped heavy over his waist. Pride is man. Sweet routine of morning run and nighttime gym. Chamomile for perfect skin, then beers to rough it up again. Grad job, new wheels and FIFA on Sundays. He plays the role perfectly down to a T. They see him. A modern Adonis, all carpe diem and signature flawless. They see him a modern man. All techno and dick jokes. His girlfriend is beautiful. They make quite the pair. She's the talk of the office. Golden, they call them all. Couple goals, hashtags. It makes him feel smug. It defines him. Tries to keep this in mind. As the boredom starts rising, the interest starts dying. He sees her eyes wandering and they argue more than they talk. And though pride is not really that bothered, he holds on to her still like a crucifix because pride is man and this morning's duvet clings to the blood of punctured ego it's cloying and sticky holds him down like a fist this room looks different to him the same space where they've smoked and they've talked and they've studied and laughed for as long as he's known his best friend his gaff now it looks like a trap now he looks like a bad decision always so easy in his skin he sees him now with skin still slick with midnight sweat and cheeks flush rose with baby blush what is he dreaming of adam and adam they lay tight rib cages pressed with umbilical closeness he makes him think poetry pride is man pride is man but is he man when nothing even happened they just talked and fell asleep he was so kind you see she'd locked him out the place again refused to see his face again he bought them beers he rolled a spliff he listened pride can't remember the last time that somebody just listened but he is man and now everywhere he looks everything seems phallic everywhere it looks it feels like someone's laughing they are stone carved god men molded through history to be what they are today they are strong men hard men tough men yet everything's fragile when step out of line and identity shattered all pride has worked to maintain pride has rainbows coursing through his veins and he feels shame and he feels clarity and the storm clouds are gathering certain to break any moment he should cry out but his words are choked with love and hate and loneliness so all he can do is hiss through his teeth at him as he blinks the day awake and spit at his goodness while his stomach churns at the thought of the guys at work and the girl at home and their words and their look and he's scared and he's sick and he just wants to hold him there you go. It's a bit of a workout reading that. <laughs> That's amazing, Imogen. What a piece. Wow. Thank you. Uh, that has made me very excited for the show. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, cause like you're saying, and it fits like, I think especially with yourself, that kind of electronic music is going to work so well. I remember so. seeing you at a gig in Edinburgh where you were working with uh, a bunch of musicians uh, mm. or, or like people working with music. What was it? The... Oh, that's it's a collective. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was cool. Um, yeah, that it, had almost a similar vibe. And like, I remember at the time thinking how well you're like tempo like a similar thing to jess even like when yeah. there, there are points when you when you just like rapid fire uh mm-hmm. through some lines and stuff and it's just it, like yeah that framing of it with some some electronic music is going to be uh, very cool um yeah so. what, a, what a beautifully written piece the uh, pride has rainbows running through his veins and feels shame uh mm-hmm. Yes, well, uh, while we recover from that, uh, thank you so much, Imogen, that was amazing. And thank you so much for coming on the Loudcast and, and chatting all things spoken word with us. Uh, there will be links and all that stuff to where you can find Imogen. Uh, you can, you're on Twitter and you have a website and all that, Imogen, right? I do indeed, yes. Perfect, perfect. So there should have been a nameplate and stuff, but what, what's your at on Twitter? On Twitter, I am Imogen underscore Sterling. That's cool we'll go and grab Imogen on Twitter you'll find where to get all of her stuff and like I said there'll be links to loads of her amazing work websites and stuff all below uh, if you're listening uh, on your your podcast jump over at iamloud.co uh, you can you can find all the details there we'll have a transcript of the the, the podcast and stuff so you'll you'll find everything in that um, but yeah amazing stuff Imogen thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, guys if this is your first time watching the Loudcast then please subscribe to, to the channel or rate and review us on whatever your podcast platform is and please do come back in two weeks time when we will have another extraordinary guest in the way of robert florence uh, it's going to be a cracking show but for now thank you so much for watching guys and we'll see you again soon imogen say goodbye thank you so much for having me it was a total pleasure thank you Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.